Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to episode 56 of Direwolf20's Let's Play series. Charging up my chest plate, because I'm heading back to the deep dark. Dun dun dun. So last episode, what'd we do? Uh, we got this whole system set up. Hooray! Kind of hooray. Let's see. I've noticed when jumping between the deep dark and the overworld, I get a little bit of lag. There we go. Um, so, what we did was set up this cool system. Uh, the mining apparatus is now in the deep dark. The deep dark has double ore generation, so we're going to get twice as much stuff by mining in here. But it, of course, has its own little bit of uh, problems. You've got uh, the Vash de Narada, as I refer to it, that will attack you in the dark, so make sure to keep it well lit wherever you're going to be. Uh, you're also going to probably run into some of these stalagmites and stalactites and other pillars and other things that are just in the way. So I decided to make a force field projector that we're going to set up in disintegration mode that's going to basically allow you to constantly, um, you know, charge up and destroy any blocks in front of the uh, force field projector. That's kind of the plan, at least for now. So uh, we're going to go ahead and um, set it up today so that, um, as we can see here, uh, we're going to be, well actually let me take the disintegration module out so you can demonstrate all the blocks that are in front of anything that could be, you know, moving. So I've got it tall enough to be able to uh, make sure the turtle can move through and I've got it wide enough to make sure this far right turtle can move through and uh, low enough to get the mining well. So pretty much everything is um, going to be covered by this force field. And then what we're going to do is set it up so that um, the force field is going to have the disintegration module in installed. And uh, by the way, the reason this is chewing just through tons of power, we really need to see what we can do about making that a little bit more efficient. I might need to install some speed upgrades in here or something. I don't know. We'll figure something out. But uh, long story short, our goal is to be able to um, activate the force field, cause it to break any um, blocks in front of it, and then allow the thing to move through. So we're going to need to program this guy to start sending signals over to uh, this guy. Uh, I'm going to make sure to have the, um, the disintegration module in there, and even though it does cost more energy to have a collection module installed, I'm going to go ahead and do it just to make sure that uh, you know we're pretty good. And also, how much more energy for a little bit of a speed module? Yeah, just the five speed modules I have. It, inc it increases the cost a little bit, but it's totally worth it, because it's going to mean it'll be able to break the blocks in front faster. Now what we're going to do is I'm probably going to set up the turtle to try and move forward, and if it fails to move forward, it's going to activate this for, let's say, like 5 or 10 seconds. And then it's going to turn it off, and it's going to try to move forward again. Now, if we didn't clear all the blocks away, it's going to go into a loop and basically say, all right, the blocks are not cleared away completely. I'm going to activate this guy for another 5 or 10 seconds, and then try to move again. Still not cleared? Activate him again for another 5 or 10 seconds. All right, now it's cleared. We were able to move forward, so I'm going to move forward, and we'll continue the mining operation. So that should be pretty efficient. Uh, the only thing we need to make sure of is that, you know, maybe if there's a block, like, in front of it right here, that's obviously going to get stuck as soon as it tries to move. However, if there's, like, a block here, what's going to happen? Well, long story short, it's not going to get stuck at, let's say, this point. It might not even get stuck when it gets all the way over here, but it might get stuck once it gets and bumps into this stone brick right here. And then our force field destruction thing will not be any use to us, because basically what's going to happen is um, it'll be all the way back there by the time it's coming up the movement of the frame motion thing, and we're going to have a little bit of a problem. And we won't be able to break it with our force field because this thing's configured to only uh, break directly in front. So what I think we should do is basically have like uh, some kind of blocks or something here that just kind of go as tall as this thing is going to be. So something like that. So that if there's any block anywhere along the way, it'll catch it. We're just going to have to put these all the way across here. That shouldn't be too big of a deal to set up. And then we'll have a really efficient system. All right, let me get what I need to get started here, and we'll be right back. All right, guys, believe it or not, I think I wrote all this code and it worked the first time. That usually doesn't happen for me, so I'm going to go and show you basically how this works. Um, I know, as usual, not many people like seeing a lot of the code, so don't worry, I'm not going to go too in-depth into how it works, but I do want to give a brief overview uh, just for those of you who are interested. So basically what I have it doing, and I'm going to give you an overview first and then I'll go into the code very briefly, um, is I have the turtle sitting here and initiating a move like we were before, but then I have him turn to the right and check if there's a block there. If the block is still there he says all right 
The chest is still there, which means, hey, uh, this thing didn't move properly, so there must be something stuck. So he sends a signal over to here to turn on the force field projector. And then he uh, will uh, wait five seconds and then try to do the move again. Now, if the move fails again, he's going to turn it on again for five seconds. And he's going to try again and again and again. And eventually, once it does move, he's going to consider himself done. So let's test all the different scenarios that we could run into. First off, I'm just going to tell him to run uh, the normal mine program with no blockage. This will confirm that everything's working like it was before. So we can see we're mining here. The wells are down. And then it's going to try and move a few seconds later and everything worked properly. So, no problems, right? Now, the next scenario might be that there's a block in front of this. So let's say there's one block in the way causing a problem. Let's run the mine program again. Same thing's gonna happen, but when he tries to move, he's going to turn to the right and see that that chest is still there. Watch. So then he's gonna activate the force field, which destroys the block in front, and then he's gonna check again. And ta-da, he was successfully able to move. And he checked, saw that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, chest wasn't there, so he moved forward. Cool, right? So now let's try one more scenario where there's multiple blocks in the way, and he has to run this multiple times. So let's watch. Over here, we're going to run mine once again. And the mining wells are doing their thing, chewing up the earth. And then let's see what happens. So he's going to try and move it, and it's going to fail. And then he's going to check and see that the chest is there. Watch him turn. There he goes. So he activates the force field thing to destroy the blocks in front. Now this can only destroy a few blocks within that five second time frame. So when he tried to move again, it failed again, so he turns the force field on again. So see how he keeps checking? He checks again. And then he turns on the force field thing again. And eventually he'll destroy the blocks. I guess at this point we've run out of power, so that's probably a downside. So we have to give this thing a little bit of a speed boost here. Let's, uh, let's speed boost the Fortron capacitor so that he can transfer energy a little bit faster. There we go. He managed to clear the block in front, and now he finally was able to move the whole thing, and he considers himself done. Nice, right? All right, real quick looking at the code. So what I want to do is demonstrate to you guys functions, which I didn't really do much of before. I broke the code into what's called functions, which basically are little chunks of code that you can organize together. So one function is called wells. All that does is operate the mining wells. It sets the redstone color to orange, uh, does the countdown, and then sets it to zero. So whenever we call the wells function, it's just going to operate the mining wells. The move quarry function is simply going to move the quarry. All it does is activate the magenta color, wait a couple seconds, and then turn it off. Now after the move quarry function is done doing the move, it calls the check move function, which turns the turtle to the right, checks if there's a uh, chest to the right, so it just creates a variable called chest, and does turtle.detect, which is either true or false. Then it turns back to face the correct direction, and uh, if the chest is still there, it runs the clear blockage, and then it tries to move quarry again. And then if move quarry again, uh, it'll check move again. So it'll keep going, move quarry, check move, move quarry, check move, move quarry, check move, until this checking for a chest is false. Clear blockage is real simple, just wait five seconds after turning on the, the thing. And then uh, finally we call move turtle, which just grabs the block from under it with the dig command and moves forward. So that's your two minutes or less, hopefully, uh, demonstration of all the code for this program, all right? So now all it does is it places down the red net cable beneath when you call the program. It initiates the mining wells, waits two seconds, and then does the move quarry, which again will move, check, move, check, move, check, until finally it checks and returns that there's no chest there, which means the move was successful. And then once that's correct, it does the move turtle function. And then we're done. So that's pretty neat. Uh, I think, though, uh, what I'm going to do is let this run for a little bit. Now, we won't have to worry about it. So let's actually get it doing its uh, startup function again. So let's exit here. I always just rename the startup program when I want to do a little coding. And we'll let this thing run again. So he won't ever activate this unless there's actually something in front of the wells. Pretty cool, right? Oh, yeah, there's one more thing we wanted to do, isn't there? Uh, let's let this thing move, and then we'll actually do it. I want to place down the stone bricks. So I'm thinking this needs to be tall enough to be... Is that right? Four blocks up? That's enough to catch the um, 
turtle there. And we can also demonstrate this by real quick taking out the disintegration module and activating the force field projector. Yeah, see, that matches up pretty well. So basically, we would just want, um, you know, to have uh, the builder's wand here extend out and hit up like that. So pretty much anywhere where we're seeing a force field, we want to have um, some blocks. That way we'll know, you know, everything's doing what we want it to do. It's going to catch on the block on the front before it allows this thing to move. Hopefully I brought enough blocks with me. Oh, look at that. See, we're running out of power again. I'm going to have to do something about that power loss. But it's it's going to be not the end of the world. All, the worst thing that's going to happen is it's just going to slow down the whole operation. Um, because basically what will happen is it will just take longer for the disintegration to run. So if we are out of power, it's just going to keep checking and trying and checking and trying. And eventually it will clear those blocks. It will just be slower because it's out of power. Um, but overall, I think that is going to be what we want it to be. Cool, right? Um, and this guy should wind up moving. Oh, you know what? We're not going to move the blocks on the top, are we? If we check this guy, that might be a little bit of a problem. He is a mining turtle, though, so I don't have to actually worry about that top row where the mining turtle is. If I wanted to, I could clear that out. Yeah. We're also going to have a problem with this guy as well, this row here. But because these are both mining turtles, that shouldn't be a problem. So instead of having this row... And instead of having this top row... I'm just going to have the mining turtles, if they fail to move forward, do a dig. So that, you know, if they get stuck, they can just break the block themselves. They don't have to worry about having the, the force field projector thing break their block cool so we can then uh remove the west is it yeah Re west will remove one of these we don't have to worry about that well you know what i'll leave it in it won't hurt if it's there it'll break it for him and if not you know it'll break it itself so that should be good that looks cool all right let's just have it do one move to make sure everything's running smoothly and then i think we're pretty good with this whole build and then I just have to modify the code to say, hey, if you happen to get stuck while trying to move, do a turtle dig. That's no big deal. Look at that, working perfectly. Checking and then moving. Love it. So let's just see a quick demonstration here. Um, we're going to set this guy up. He should have no problem moving forward right now. But if there does happen to get a block placed like right um, here in front of him, he should attempt to move forward, fail, break the block, and then attempt to move forward again. Watch. See? Cool. So one more test. We're going to try um, doing this with these blocks here. And let's see what happens. And I think we're pretty much done after this. So he tried to move forward and he failed. So what he's going to do is he's going to initiate the destruction of those blocks. And I'm getting attacked, but that's okay. I'll live. Come on, light. And then back to dark so I can watch this. And then he clears them away. And then successful movement. Perfect. Everything's working great. So I think this is a nice, stable build. We're going to keep an eye on it for a little bit, but uh, yeah, I am loving this. It's working great. Everything's working the way I want. Um, I think we've covered most of our bases. Nice. Oh yeah, did I mention there's emeralds in the deep dark? Yeah, there's emeralds in the deep dark. I, d I was just checking. I wasn't actually sure about this, but I was keeping an eye on my uh, ME system for a few minutes here, and I was at 70 emeralds a moment ago, and now I'm up to 72. Uh, so while this uh, whole operation is running, and you can just see like the crazy amount of stuff coming in, um, lots of ores, obviously. My uh, mass raiders are going crazy. Yeah, we have a lot to keep an eye on. So I've been letting my mining well run for a little bit, as you can see, and uh, look what I found in front of it. So I guess this is as good a test as any to make sure that the whole let's make sure things don't have a problem works. Um, once this thing catches up to over here, we'll find out how well the whole break blocks in front of it thing goes. I don't mind taking a quick look in here to see if I find any good loot though. All right, guys, now that we've got this organized, let's get back to some automation. So as you recall, I, uh, a couple episodes back, upgraded my storage unit for the ME chest. Uh, it's storing a bunch of mana beans, which is really helping me out and getting me ready to go with some cool uh, Thaumcraft plans that I have ready for the future. However, I just threw a hardened energy cell down here because I was like, eh, you know, a little bit lazy. Didn't really feel like making a Tesseract at the time. Tesseracts are a lot of work. They're just a lot of work is basically what it comes down to. Um, and this thing is running 
beautifully, by the way, I do have to say. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that that thing's running so well. Uh, so what I would like to do is automate the creation of Tesseracts. Now, uh, you guys have probably seen me do this once or twice before. Um, I've got a little bit more efficient way to do it. I've run into problems before, and I think I've come up with solutions to those problems. So we're going to see that today. Um, just checking on a couple of my things. I do want to check on my uh, boiler as well. He should be having no problem at this point with all the uh, alimentum we've got cooked up in here. Nice. Wow, he is struggling to keep up with the amount of steam use, though, because, uh, we're, you know, we're probably burning through a lot of steam, uh, making up for the resonant energy cell being burned up while I was mining. Like, to be honest with you, my, that mining well machine, while awesome, does burn up a lot of power, like a ton. I mean, these 15 uh, steam dynamos, not even close to keeping up with it. It destroys this resonant energy cell after a few moves. So, but it's still awesome. Like, it's just super fast. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. look at that. Plenty of coal. All right, so what I'm going to do is get ready to automate the production of resonant energy cells, which is going to go a long way towards showing you guys uh, some really advanced things you can do with applied energistics. So what are all the steps to make a Tesseract? Well, there's many machines involved, if you think about it, from thermal expansion. First off, we need a fluid transposer to take the Tesseract frame that's empty and fill it with resonant ender. Of course, resonant ender needs a magma crucible. So there's two blocks right there. Uh, we're also going to need to get for this thing uh, some hardened glass, which requires obsidian dust, which requires a pulverizer, as we know. So we're going to have to manage to figure that out. Then we're also going to have to uh, combine a couple different things and some crafting recipes. We're also going to finally need um, some endearium blend, which requires some tin dust, some pulverized shiny metal, and some resonant ender buckets, which again requires a magma crucible and a fluid transposer to actually fill up the bucket. So there's many steps involved here, right? So let's get started laying out the machines first and then see what kind of craziness we can get into here. So uh, first off, we're gonna need power. So let's make sure that we've got um, a redstone line going into here. So we've got some of these and we're gonna wanna lay out these machines like so. We'll put down the pulverizer, the induction smelter, the fluid transposer, and the magma crucible kind of in this order. So one, two, three, four. Okay, and let's lay it out so that the pulverizer, we're actually going to close out all the inputs and exits for a minute, just so that we can organize things very nicely. Um, for sure, we want to make sure that anything that we throw into the magma crucible is going to output directly into the fluid transposer, because anytime uh, we want to, uh, you know, melt down the ender pearls, we want them to absolutely go into the fluid transposer. So that's one configuration that we're going to make. Uh, next up, we're going to need power for all these guys. So let's make sure we've got that running. Let me go find a power line down under the walls here. Hey, look, there's one. By the way, portable hole, really nice way to do this whole uh, let's find a power line thing. Oh, probably didn't want to break that block, did I? That's okay. Watch this. Hopefully this will work. Gotta love multi-parts. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, clear this out. And then we've just got these machines ready to go. One, two, three, four. All right. You guys all have power now and should be happy. Good. So now that that's uh, chilling out, doing its thing, a little bit of a block update sometimes required to clear away that mess. And let's get the stuff we're going to need to craft. So as we know, we're definitely going to need some ME interfaces. But there's a little bit of trickiness to this, right? The main thing is with an ME interface, you're allowed to have one uh, pattern that says, hey, this item plus this item equals this third item, right? Well, the problem comes in with Tesseracts when you want to, for example, uh, get one of those filled frames, for example. So we need to put the Tesseract frame into the fluid transposer but we need to put the ender pearls into the magma crucible. So how are we going to accomplish that? Well, if you guys have watched my uh, multiplayer series, you know that I've probably already come up with a solution. So we're going to demonstrate that here now in the single player series with a little bit more of a tutorial style. As you know, my uh, server play series, I sometimes move a little quicker because I expect you guys to probably know more about the mods. All right, so let's get ourselves a chest. You know what, I'm just going to get some wood for a second. Wood. And I did teach this thing how to make wood, right? Or I didn't. Just in case. Uh, let's see. Yeah, oak wood. Give me a stack of those. I think they have a long distance to travel, don't they? They're probably coming all the way from my tree farm. There they come. I'm really hesitant to take away this uh, 
awesome interaction between these two mods because it's so fun watching the stuff flow through the pipes. All right, let's clear this out. We're just going to teach you make wood nice and easy um, and put you in here so that we know how to do that for future reference and then chest. Cool. So what I'm going to do is make a chest real quick. And just because I know I'm going to need chests later anyway, might as well teach the system how to make it now. Uh, and then we're going to get some item ducts. And then we're going to get some pneumatic servos. We're going to want at least three or four of them, so might as well just craft them all up right now. You might be smelting some glass. What are you doing? Smelting glass? Yeah. Which is probably in the induction furnace. Cool. Three and four. Nice. So what we can do uh, to trick this thing a little bit is actually use um, some intelligence with pneumatic servos and item ducts. Okay, so all we have to do is say the following. Uh, let's grab our wrench, our hammer thing, so we're ready for that. And we'll have a chest probably just sitting right here. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put the ender pearls and the empty um, frame into the chest. And then we're going to have it automatically pulling out all the time. So we just install these guys. So you will we'll say um, always pull items out. This guy, we're going to filter what items are allowed in here. Um, so for now, I don't have one of those ender frame things, but I do have some ender pearls. So let's get one of these and just say ender pearls are what goes into the magma crucible. So we're going to whitelist ender pearls. And for now, we're just going to whitelist this thing with cobblestone so it doesn't let anything else in. But eventually what's going to happen is we're going to say, um, put the frame in here. So what happens is we're going to tell the AE system, put the ender pearls in the empty frame in the chest. The chest will handle sorting it properly into the fluid transposer and the magma crucible. And that'll eventually come together to make the filled frame. And then we pull the fold frame back into the uh, AE system and we've got awesomeness. Cool? So that's the basic gist. We'll demonstrate this in a minute, but this is just the initial preparation for it. We're also going to need a couple interfaces and a couple cables and a couple other um, AE related items. So let me grab a few of those and I'll be right back. All right, so let's assault this uh, from the start. Tesseracts, uh, the very beginning that we're gonna have to make or the more complicated stuff we make. First off, we need to know how to make hardened glass, which is pulverized obsidian and lead. And pulverized obsidian, one obsidian, four pulverized obsidian. So let's get that going. We're going to teach this guy. I'm just going to get, um, let's just toss in the obsidian into the pulverizer. And then we'll um, set this up. One obsidian equals four pulverized obsidian in code. Good. So now we know how to do that. Uh, but remember, we don't put it in here. Derp. You put uh, the interface on top of the pulverizer, and we'll go ahead and rotate it downwards, and we'll put this guy in there like so. Cool. So that's what we've got going on there. Uh, next up, we need to combine for the glass, hardened glass, is eight pulverized obsidian and one lead, and that goes into the induction smelter. So let's set this up. Induction smelter, and we want to make sure this is not connected. And we want eight. All right, stop that. There we go, eight and one piece of lead ingot. But here's where the trick comes in, right? So let's see, do we have any hardened glass in here? I'm pretty sure I do. Good. How much does this make? Two. One, two. In code. There we go. Pulverized obsidian takes a little bit to make, and what will happen sometimes with the induction furnace is it might go to make something else with, um, you know, let's say we want to make the enderium ingots. 
So that's another induction smelter. So what if it got the pyrothium dust ready before it got the polarized obsidium ready? Well, it would wind up putting the pyrothium dust in to try and make the enderium ingots, and then it would put in um, the uh, stuff, the lead for the hardened glass, and it would just get stuck. So what we need to do is specify something very important. It's this setting right here, blocking mode. What it's going to do is we're going to say, do not push crafting items if the inventory contains items. So what's going to happen is if there's already items in here, it's not going to push new items in. So since we're inserting from the top, we're going to set blue mode on the top for both of these guys, and then we should be in good shape. So what I should be able to do now is simply request some hardened glass. Let's, um, oh yeah, in order for this to work, we're also going to have to cup um, some cables here. So what I could do just to make this nice and simple is that. So now hardened glass should be an available recipe. Yes, it is, because these guys are all communicating with each other. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is um, set up import buses on the back. So let's set the back to export um, actually both. And this can export both as well. And we're just going to set import buses, basic import buses, here and here. Now we don't have any interface to tell these like what to pull in, so it'll just grab everything and anything that it can see. And ta-da, that's all we need to do. And this then should be pretty good. Let me out of here, you guys. So let's try it. I'm going to request like 10 hardened glass. And let's see what happens. So the first thing is it starts pulverizing the obsidian we need, and it already threw in some lead ingots for us. Cool. And uh, the uh, pulverized obsidian is getting pulled into the system with the import bus. And then the induction smelter starts to run. Look at that. And it gets two hardened glass. So now it says, all right, I need to make another set. So that is multi-step processing with the induction smelter and the pulverizer from thermal expansion. That's very cool. And that's going to be very useful very soon. So enderium ingots are the next thing we're going to need, which is pyrothium dust, pulverized coal, sulfur, redstone, blaze powder. Okay, so let's go ahead and get these guys all prepped. Um, the other thing we're going to need for that is uh, the enderium blend, but that's even crazier to make. So give me a minute, we'll get this ready. So then we're going to teach this thing how to make pyrothium dust. And we've already programmed the ME interface here for uh, pulverized coal. And I told it to pulverize blaze rods into blaze powder because you get four instead of two. So you might as well be efficient with your blaze rods, right? So we'll go ahead and set that up. Um, so that's going to be no problem making um, the pyrothium blend. So if we grabbed a couple of those and requested one, it should real quick make it, because that's just a crafting thing. Uh, we have a couple pieces of pulverized coal. If we had to pulverize stuff, it would take a little longer, but not that big a deal. All right, so the next piece is the enderium blend. That is going to be a little bit trickier, uh, because there's a couple steps involved in here. So um, the enderium blend is tin dust, pulverized tin, and pulverized shiny metal. So let's get some tin. Saltpeter. Okay, I was going to say, why is all that dust sitting there? Um, and shiny metal. I don't think I have any shiny dust on hand, so I'm going to need an extra one uh, just to teach the system how to make it. So we'll try and catch this guy before he pulls back into the system. Good, I got him. And then um, the same here with the tin. Cool. So clear this out. You become you in code, and you become you. And let's get ourselves some more blank. Cooking glass, I presume? Yes. Enough for now. I'll get the other seven in a minute. All right, so uh, pulverized tin is good, and then you and you for pulverized shiny metal ingot. Cool. So if we put these guys away, the last thing we need to do is get a bucket of um, ender liquid. So let's take a look at that. So enderium requires enderium blend, which requires resonant ender bucket. So resonant ender bucket is basically um, you have to fluid transpose, I think, a thousand milliliters, and you can see you get 250 millibuckets from one ender pearl. So it's four ender pearls and a bucket. So let's see, bucket. I don't know how to make one of those yet, so let's teach it. Empty bucket. See how much crazy automation you can get with this stuff? It gets a little insane. But once you have it all done, it's awesome. And then we want some ender pearls. 
So we basically say over here, and this is where the real trick is going to come in. Uh, we're going to say four and one. I don't think I can click and drag the Enderium bucket, can I? No. So we need one in order for this to work. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead and prep it here to demonstrate what it's going to look like. So we already say ender pearls are allowed in here. We're going to say um, buckets are allowed to come into here, like so. So that when this um, ME interface is inserting into the chest, as you can see, it's going to do here. All I got to do is link it up. Uh, we're going to put in these four things. It's going to automatically be pulled out. Once we set this input here and this input here, and you can see the bucket went in there and the ender pearls should go in here. See there, they did. And then what'll happen is um, it'll pull the uh, resonant ender side by side. And then once it's got all four done, it fills the bucket. And then we just have to uh, specify back here to import into the AE network. All we have to do is say the back is an export of any kind. Cool, right? So now that we have an ender bucket, we can set this guy. So we say one, two, three, four, plus a bucket. Gets us the resonant ender bucket cool. And that'll go in here so that when we request it, it'll drop four ender pearls into the chest and it'll drop one bucket into the chest, which will then get distributed because of the item ducks. And then like we just saw, we'll get an enderium bucket. Cool, right? And then the final piece of this is the enderium blend, which we can shift click in here. So enderium blend, no, that's ender pearl dust. Is, um, Pulverized tin. Let me get actual proper pulverized tin. Just because, you know, because it's or dictionary, it should work, but sometimes it's a little funny and doesn't. So it's best to have the proper stuff in there and then encode that. Oh, wait, need another. That's why I made these blank and encode. Cool. And that's just a regular old crafting recipe, so it goes in here. So now we've got all that set up. Crazy, right? I know, it's getting a little bit nuts. So if we put all this together, and we got the Enderium blend, if I just requested one, it should automatically do what it needs to do. So it's currently pulverizing some tin for me, and then it should combine the resonant ender bucket, and it gets me the Enderium blend. Cool. And pyrothium dust. And what I can do here now, because I don't think I have any Enderium ingots, right? No. We're going to need some to demonstrate to the system how to work. So, one more check. It's two Enderium blend and one Pyrothium dust in the induction smelter. So, two Enderium blend and one Pyrothium dust. That's what we'll put here. Clear this out. One, two, and one. This thing should get pulled in. But I snagged it nice and quick. Encode this guy. And again, we want to make sure that um, it knows to be in blocking mode. That's really important, because if it's not, your system will gum up, and it just won't work. So trust me, blocking mode is the way to go. So now, we should be good to request two more of these. So begin, and it should snag that Enderium blend. It's going to smelt it together, and then we should see this thing show up with two in there. Dun, dun, dun. So now the only downside is I don't have enough ender pearls to finish this up, so I'm gonna have to wait until I have a few more. I think it's about time I get over to the end and start maybe having to deal with the ender dragon, just because I'm so low on ender pearls, and I'm gonna have to go over there and farm those endermen quite a bit in order to get myself more ender pearls, because I'm just the, the the six or so of those little seeds that I have just aren't cutting it. All right, so the final piece here, well, one of the final pieces. The second to last piece is the Tesseract frame, which I'll just encode and go into here. So the next part of this will be to put a Tesseract frame into the chest with uh, 16, I think it is, right? To fill this up. Oh no, it's just, it's just one bucket's worth. That's not too bad. 
So four ender pearls plus one tesseract frame will get me the tesseract frame full. That's going to be another recipe that goes in here. And I was having so much fun teaching my system how to make tesseracts that we ran past the time. So it's time to wrap up the episode. I'm going to wait for a few more ender pearls, um, and then I'm going to finish up the uh, preparation. Probably next episode, it'll only take a minute or two, one or two little additions there, and we're good to go. But as we know, um, this is just not working out for me. These ender lily seeds, too slow, need more. Um, so we're going to find a way to get more ender pearls. It's probably going to involve some kind of ender enderman farm. Though there's a couple other things I might be able to do. We'll see. So I'll come up with some stuff and we'll get some more end pearls and then we'll have a lot of fun. For now, this is Direwolf20 signing off. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We have a really nice mining system down here in the deep dark, which I'll probably let run for a little bit. All right, guys, take it easy.